Uh, I'm Executive Director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. David Wood is our um, is on our Board of Directors. Um, some of you know me, um, but I I'm a sociologist by background. Um, started dabbling in this transhumanism stuff back in the 90s. Became the first Executive Director of the World Transhumanist Association. Um, that spun off the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which we call a techno-progressive think tank. Uh, cyborg virtue or the, the cyborg, uh, the, the, the idea of moral enhancement has never been very central to the mission of the IET. It's always been a passionate interest of mine. I've been trying to write a book about it for a long time. Uh, we can talk about why I haven't made more progress. But um, the, I have written many papers about it and um, I have a pretty worked out notion of what I want to write. Um, but the con in the context of global authoritarian, rise of authoritarianism, it's uh, become a little bit more complicated, what I want to say. So I'll try to run through the argument quickly and give us time for conversation. Um, the I, argument- I, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering about that photo, James. Oh, oh <laughs> yes, the photo. Uh, so uh, I became Buddhist when I was 16, uh, have always been a rather eclectic, non-denominational Buddhist, but um, I taught Buddhist meditation when I was in college and then went after I graduated to Sri Lanka to work for a Buddhist development organization. They invited me to ordain and I was in robes for about four months. So I don't have a lot of street cred, but uh, I do have pictures of myself as a Buddhist monk, which I trot out just to show people that my commitment to the idea of virtue and moral improvement and uh, spirituality is not simply an intellectual one, but has been something I've been passionate about over time. So I was about 23 in this picture, I guess. A lot thinner. Um, okay, so the idea, in general, the ideas of transhumanism and the techno-progressive approach to um, moral enhancement or human enhancement um, is predicated on the notion that we uh, that there is a continuity from before the present of various things that we've done to ourselves as human beings um, that is important to situate the things that are happening now in. Um, in other words, fire was the first uh, technological mastery that allowed a certain coevolution of the human and technology. Um, when we mastered fire between a million and two million years ago, we became able to eat enough calories to allow our prefrontal cortexes to grow. And so we direct, directly influence the course of our own biological evolution through the mastery of fire. Um, so the idea of enhancement um, or the prospect of enhancement is not something new. We are already cyborgs. However, there, we're, we live in a period in which there is a convergence of rapidly and perhaps algorithmically or exponentially accelerating technological innovation in a number of different fields, which create um, unpredictable, uh, unpredictably predictable um, uh, innovations in a variety of fields. Other, in other words, we know that we will probably want to be healthier and live longer in the future. We don't know which technology is ex exactly going to get us there or what combination of technologies. And it may be technologies that we haven't even thought of yet, but we're pretty sure that because of these accelerating trends in technology and the interface between them, uh, accelerations in psychopharmacology, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and so on, that um, we will have prospects of technological application in the future that are currently considered science fictional by everyone in responsible uh, public policy, but that are in fact in our future. Exactly how we get there is, is part of the dilemma and question and the difficulty of public policy. So I prefer to start from the notion that we're going to be able to do X thing that everyone has been doing for a very long time and people will still want to do in the future. We know that it'll probably involve some mix or set of technologies, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. And there are important questions depending on whether it's genetics or nanotechnology or psychopharmacology that get us there. But that's the beginning point of this perspective. Um, now, in the case of brain chips in particular, which is what I'm going to be addressing in this talk, 
the um, expectation from popular culture has been there for a long time. I mean, 30, 40 years, popular culture has been, been introducing the idea of the cyborg and the idea of uh, bring computer interfaces and the Borg and, you know, so, so the Borg was from the 1980s. Um, and I think that uh, it has, we have fully marinated in apocalyptic expectations about what bring computer interfaces might entail. And overall, the um, evidence from, for instance, this recent survey of Americans about, uh, by Pew about whether they think it's a good idea or a bad idea to um, have chips in your head. Um, most Americans or majority of Americans say that it's a bad idea and um, only 13% say it's a good idea. I'll point out that the um, acceptance of the idea is higher among younger people than older people, it's higher among men than women, and it's higher among more secular people than more religious people. Um, and so there is a, a convergence, which I've written about in other places, of more techno-optimism with uh, certain other social views. So for instance, I, for me, although I'm not gonna get into it in this talk, but for me, the, um, the convergence of the attitudes around sexuality and gender, um, which has become central to the global fight against neo-authoritarianism and neo-fascism, it's why the Russian Orthodox patriarch said they were invading Ukraine was to stop gay pride parades. It's uh, why you can't say gay in public schools in Florida. It's why a lot of American states are banning uh, the therapies for transgender youth. Um, that's very central to the current debate uh, about sexuality. Um, at any rate, um, there's a connection between these social um, moral attitudes and our attitudes about technology that I think is central to the way that this is shaping up politically. Setting aside the fact that uh, younger secular people are, are going to be the forefront of this as they are with sex gender, um, uh, changing our views about sex and gender. Um, if you look at the technology itself and you ask people what kind of uh, modifications could we make to this technology, which would be useful for um, people who in therapeutic conditions, for instance. So here it says, um, they asked, do you think it would be okay to have a brain chip if it allowed increased movement for people who are paralyzed, which is gonna be the principal application of most of the invasive neurotechnologies that I'm gonna talk about um, for a while. Um, and most people are in favor of that. So over here, they're saying, well, it's not a good idea in general, but for people with severe paralysis, yes. How about age-related mental decline? Now, age-related mental decline is something that quite a lot of us, I'm 60 years old, I feel like I have some age-related mental decline. If I could go to my doctor and say, hey, I've got age-related mental decline, could you give me a brain chip? I don't think they would right now, but um, most Americans are okay with the idea of people with age-related mental decline getting a brain chip. So that's a pretty big swath of people who might eventually get brain chips. Then they say, well, how about directly translating your thoughts into text? And then it's like half and half or you know, evenly divided and searching the internet by thinking alone. Well, I don't know why anyone's opposed to that, but some people are, and but a quarter of people are think that's an okay idea. So as with many public policies, you say, well, what do you think about nuclear war? And people are like, oh, that's a terrible idea. And then they say, well, what do you think about X policy or Y policy that relates to it, and they have different opinions. So decomposing the way that people feel about these technologies is important. And then this final uh, slide here says, how would you feel about it if people could turn on and off the effects? Which I don't know of any brain technology where it's impossible to turn on and off, turn off the effect. I mean, that would be a kind of definition of horror, um, although I'll talk about the possibility later. Um, and most people think that that would make it more acceptable. And then uh, if it could be put in place without surgery. So that's the non-invasive part of this. So I'm going to be talking about uh, all of these different options. And I'm also going to be talking about it in the context of a very problematic history of moral neuroscience, which um, goes back far. But um, one key point of moral neuroscience history was the case of Phineas Gage, uh, 
He had this iron bar blown through his skull. According to the kind of legend that grew up around his case, um, he was a, a well-balanced mind before that, a shrewd and smart businessman, energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. And after he had this incredibly traumatic brain injury, he's fitful, irreverent, indulging in the grossest profanity. He became a moral, immoral person, according to the, the accounts. And um, this implied that whatever was damaged in his brain was the seat of some of these moral capabilities. Now, the revisionist understanding of Phineas Gage is that he actually, as many people with severe brain injuries do, he was able to uh, compensate and eventually uh, uh, pursue occupations that, where he did not display the kind of moral deficits that people implied. And, and that's an important point that I'll come back to later, that um, the brain is in fact plastic. Localization isn't the end of the story. But um, the idea of localization, I think, has taken on um, its own weight over time because we've had now 150 years of evidence of uh, specific brain lesions, strokes, and cancers, and surgeries that have specific behavioral and cognitive and emotive effects on people. And the mapping of those effects then plugged into brain imaging so we can put people in fMRI scanners or PET scanners, ask them specific questions, evoke specific memories, um, and uh, have them think specific thoughts. And then we can see what lights up in the brain. And um, so there are many lines of evidence that have supported the notion that specific parts of the brain in general um, are there for specific purposes, have specific functions in our emotional and cognitive life, and that interrupting them or enhancing them uh, might have specific benefits. Now, the other thing that this talk is in the context of is this long debate over moral enhancement, not long, it's 15, 15 years old debate um, between a lot, uh, a, a, a limited, a, a finite number of bioethicists who are interested in the question, uh, but a growing number, um, who have primarily focused on psychopharmaceuticals. They primarily focused on the connections between specific neurochemicals like oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, to specific moral cognitions and behaviors. Um, and uh, more generally, as Pramod uh, implied, um, have been debating about the importance of enhancing particular moral virtues. So um, the way I would caricature the long and interesting debate between people like Julian Savalescu and John Harris is that uh, Savalescu is more interested in uh, controlling the emotive aspects of moral behavior, um, in particular selfishness and counterbalancing it with empathy, and the kind of poster child for this is oxytocin, which is the cuddle drug. And many people push back, right? But some people push back on the basis of authenticity and freedom and the self, um, like John Harris has done. Um, but, uh, and I can, and I'll address that later. But um, they also push back on the notion that the understandable intuition that if everyone was just kinder, you know, in a world of 99% sheep, the 1% of wolves would have free reign and, and so on and so forth. The, the, it could be a vice to be too kind, uh, to sacrifice all of your self-interest. I agree with that too. Um, John Harris, on the other hand, um, emphasizing more the cognitive and intellectual virtue aspects of moral behavior. And for me, as Pramod implied and we just discussed, um, I think that a lot of this is pretty naive given the history of uh, philosophical and, and religious interrogation of the concept of moral character, that moral character is not simply the enhancement of one virtue towards perfection. Um, it is the creation of a balance of virtues appropriate to you and your situation and your society. Um, uh, and that those understanding what those different virtues should be and are in your world is part of the challenge here. Um, and uh, that because these kinds of bioethicists have a more limited and consequentialist background, they don't appreciate uh, the importance of those 
multi-virtue models to this. And so I'm going to uh, briefly introduce that in a second. Now, the kinds of technologies that I'm addressing here are novel for me because I had been mostly focusing on writing about um, the biochemical uh, as the use of psychopharmaceuticals, for instance, or hormone enhancement, and then trying to relate that to um, external electronic modification, so uh, ways that we could have artificial moral assistance, for instance, and then also the behavioral and the social, so uh, ways that exercise, diet, sleep uh, affect our moral personalities and also the way that living in different kinds of social situations affects them. I hadn't really given much attention to the growing body of evidence relating to brain stimulation of particular regions, localized regions of moral uh, consequence. And uh, so this was an attempt to pull that together and to imagine what the advantages might be for uh, an eventual use of electric or electronic or magnetic or whatever kinds of simulation of the brain as opposed to the, the neurochemical. So the particular uh, technologies that have had uh, substantial body of research so far, the external ones include basically using electrical juice, magnetism, and sound to zap highly focused parts of the brain. Um, transcranial direct current stimulation is something that you can figure out how to make for a couple hundred, you know, for less than a hundred bucks, I think. Um, if you go on YouTube and find a video about how to put one together, I wouldn't recommend that. And uh, the ones that you can buy commercially are a couple hundred bucks and purport to do the same thing that they're doing in the lab, I still wouldn't recommend it. But um, it, people are doing it outside of labs and they're certainly doing it in labs under much more controlled conditions of running electrical current through. Now, TMS and um, focused ultrasound are not things that are commercially available or I think for most people buildable, um, but um, certainly are being done in labs with more or less plausibility of eventually being commercially accessible or um, uh, cheap, uh, mobile. Um, but at any rate, they provide some of the same evidence that would be useful for determining the effect of these technologies on moral uh, uh, cognition and behavior. And in terms of internal uh, stimulation and inhibition, of course, with focused ultrasound and electricity and magnetism, you can get down to you know, a cubic centimeter or whatever brain tissue, but that's still a lot of neurons. And so um, the uh, advantage and disadvantage of um, more focused in internalized forms of brain stimulation is that you're limited to a smaller number of neurons, although they can have cascading effects throughout the rest of the brain. And I realized that we have a, co a computational neuroscientist in our midst. So again, my disclaimer, I'm a sociologist, please correct me <laughs> later. But, um, but we have a number of different kinds of internalized or more or less internalized, I guess, vagus nerve stimulation in this case is um, actually uh, external in this case, uh, but in the past has been an internal uh, vagus nerve stimulation technique. And the vagus nerve seems to have effects on the parasympathetic nervous system that um, can be useful for treating various kinds of disorders. And here they've figured out how to stimulate the vagus nerve uh, from an external source, but otherwise internal. DBS, deep brain stimulation, um, very useful for tremor disorders and um, severe epilepsy and intractable uh, treatment resistant depression. Um, the brain chips, um, which Elon Musk and, and others, many others are working on this and have been for decades, um, the, but the, the Musk Neuralink brain chip uh, is two orders of magnitude thinner leads, uh, two orders of magnitude more leads uh, leading into the brain. And um, I think it's a very promising model um, of what we might uh, have in the near term, he says, although his prognostications have some uh, truth uh, problems, but uh, or, so he's not always correct in his predictions. But he said he thinks that this year they will get an FDA uh, human trial approved of um, Neuralink. So we'll have to see how quickly that happens. 
Um, but this would certainly be a leap forward in both um, the mass manufacturer of uh, of these technologies and um, their application in humans, because almost all of the other applications, no, I don't think any other brain chip applications have ever gone to FDA approval. And then we have the neural dust. And all of these are things, neural dust is basically these tiny little uh, chips and leads that could be mass manufactured and dropped into the brain at various places. And all of these kinds of technologies uh, for me are simply what's happening today and when you extrapolate to the future, the important uh, thing to imagine is how uh, the miniaturization, the increasing, comp uh, putting more computing power into these devices in the brain, linking them together in the brain, linking them to external computing resources, um, improving their biocompatibility so that they don't get insisted by brain tissue. As we imagine all of these kinds of progress, we eventually get to the more Kurzweilian future of uh, having a billion of these things um, that don't interfere with our brain tissue that do um, are possibly able to self-replicate or something like that, that we have direct access to through external computing media. And it may take a decade, two decades, three decades, however long, but all of these kinds of uh, progress are pointing in that direction. And therefore, based on what we know now about these technologies, we need to start imagining what kinds of modalities they will be applied to in the future. And that's where I think moral enhancement has been, for me, one of the most uh, interesting and challenging uh, uh, future applications of technology. So this is the uh, model of uh, virtues that I've been using, and it came out of... Uh, uh, the positive psychology theory, really. Positive psychologists in the West were people who are um, attempting to come up with uh, a cross-cultural or metacultural understanding of what human virtues might be that could then be psychologized, that could be put into uh, self-diagnostic tests, um, that research could be consistently done on how much of it you have and whether particular interventions improve it. Um, I don't consider the positive psychologists to be great scientists, but in terms of their willingness to um, engage with the history of philosophical and religious ethics and to uh, think about what different ideas of moral personality and uh, moral psychology, how they apply to each other, and then to try to synthesize that all into a set of ultimately about 25 different virtues that they have articulated, which fall into these different pots. I think it's a very useful exercise. And um, for me, uh, I've settled on using this particular model, which is heuristic in the end, uh, but this particular model because of its correspondence with some of the moral neuropsychology stuff that I've been also looking at. So uh, basically caring, uh, positivity is the, uh, happiness, well-being, flourishing, those kinds of things. Uh, zest, there's various terms that are applied to this particular uh, hope, you know, faith, hope, and charity in the Christian tradition. Self-control being the basis of almost every um, moral code, every um, idea about what it takes to have a moral personality. If you don't have self-control, you can't really do very much of anything else. And intelligence being this complex set of intellectual virtues, prudential wisdom, and so forth. And then um, I've tucked some of the others in here, fairness, social intelligence, and mindfulness, and so forth. Now, uh, for me, this uh, kind of model, I've got dozens of these uh, maps of how it relates to um, neurochemistry, the different, uh, you know, for instance, oxytocin being more in the caring pot and serotonin being more a positivity thing and dopamine having more to do with self-control. Um, but here I've thrown in some of the Buddhist um, ethics or Buddhist virtues, the paramitas, that um, seem to fall into these different pots. And I think an important point here is to recognize that um, if you attempt to create this simplified metacultural model, um, any one culture's virtues will have, some of them will be missing, some, they'll have a lot others that aren't in this model, and they will have different constructions of what uh, the virtues themselves are. So for instance, in Buddhism, uh, 
there are four different kinds of compassion. Um, caring, uh, feeling other people's pain, feeling other people's pleasure, um, universal love, and then uh, upeka, which is the more kind of dispassionate um, part of caring that if you don't have it, you, you don't, uh, you're not very good at caring if you're not dispassionate at some points. At any rate, uh, it applies in different ways in different societies, so it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. And um, we talked earlier about personality psychology, and I think that there is a, a rough correspondence here. Um, neuroticism is the principle, as the personality trait, neuroticism is the principal correlate of people's subjective mood and happiness. Um, that is the uh, degree to which you are prone to rumination, self uh, thinking about your past and your future. Um, agreeableness, your pro social orientation, again, correlated with pro social behavior and moral uh, opinions. Conscientiousness is uh, rule following behavior and correlated with self control and open mindedness. Although it's not always intelligence, I'll get to that in a second, but. Um, Open-mindedness is correlated with IQ and various other kinds of prudential intellectual virtues. <coughs> okay, um, a couple more points before I go into the application of the brain stimulation to the moral virtues. Um, first is the, just as transhumanists in general are want to emphasize that um, there is no distinction, no real distinction. There's a, there's a spectrum, but not a distinction between therapy and enhancement. In other words, they're just with, as with the question, would you be okay if I uh, take a brain chip? No, but w to enhance myself. But would you be okay if I take a brain chip to improve my memory now that I'm 60 years old? Well, yes, but I don't have a diagnosis. So I'm someplace in between, right? I'm not, I'm not therapeutic and I'm not enhancement. Um, and then there's, of course, therapeutic, enhance, therapeutic applications that actually end up enhancing people. So there's, just as in this situation, the therapy enhancement um, doesn't work very well. I would also say in the question of moral enhancement, the suppression of vice is, a, is on a continuum with the enhancement of virtue. And every society, you know, not every society has had technologies to morally enhance, although they sometimes thought they did, various herbs and technologies, but, um, almost every society had what they thought of as technological prescriptions on technologies which would, which would enhance vice. So they were attempting to suppress vice by, for instance, um, banning alcohol. So, you know, the Islamic uh, uh, prohibitions on alcohol um, have potentially a moral, uh, and, and of course prohibitionism in the West has a moral implication. Now, if you just think about auto accidents, we think there is a moral uh, case for everyone to consider it immoral to be intoxicated when you drive or to use a cell phone or do whatever distracted thing you're doing. But let's focus on alcohol. If it's um, a, a moral case that you should not drink alcohol and drive, um, then why is it not also a moral case that you should take something that enhances your capacity to drive if you're tired, right? So truck drivers, pilots, uh, train uh, mechanics, shouldn't they all, if they've had a long day, a long shift, have a bottle of ProVigil or at least a big cup of coffee and consider it part of their moral obligation, not only not to drink alcohol, but to also take stimulants because it's been demonstrably proven that it improves their moral capacity. I think that this is, on a spectrum, it's, you know, it's not identical, but um, it is on a spectrum and that the distinctions are largely meaningless to me. Okay, come back to that. Um, I also think it's important, as uh, Pramod said, to recognize that moral enhancement has always been part of our societies and um, at least in the negative sense of recognizing that certain things are moral disenhancements, um, but also the Shamanic use of entheogens apparently goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, there have been ideas about the moral consequences of different kinds of diets in many, many societies, such as in Ayurveda, the idea that vegetarianism has an effect on our moral behavior. And it's not so much the question of whether it actually does, but um, whether we have always thought that certain kinds of foods, certain kinds of drugs, um, and certain kinds of practices have morally enhancing or disenhancing effects. 
Um, Chinese have herbal tradition goes back 3,000, 4,000 years and so forth. Um, and I think there are actually are some moral benefits of fasting, but that's a different discussion. Um, so this is a moral enhancement in this regard it goes back if you accept that moral bans on moral disenhancement is a part of moral enhancement. The moral enhancement in this regard goes back to the origins of civilization itself. Um, and in some senses, you could argue that um, civilization itself requires enhancement, that our transition from being animals to being whatever we are today, humans or cyborgs or whatever, um, is, is requires us being enculturated and trained into what it takes to be a human. And so the Confucian idea here of uh, Ren, of becoming um, a true human being through socialization and practicing and learning the virtues, I think is important. Now, if you um, are hedonic and, or you follow a more kind of Freudian approach to, to this, Freud's work on the relationship of, of, of sublimation of desire, the id and to civilization, then you think, you know, that you're your true authentic self is all these bundle of desires that whatever they are, they're also socially constructed by the way, but um, that your true self is all this bundle of desires and that civilization requires the suppression of that um, and to fit into the anthill of society. Um, if you're a eudaimonic uh, ethicist, you will be more inclined to think that the suppression of your animal nature and the cultivation of virtue is a part of not only being a civilized human being, but also the cultivation of a higher set of pleasures, a higher set of pursuits that are far more satisfying in the end than uh, being an animal. And um, of course, because of my Buddhist background, I'm more inclined towards the eudaimonic view. At least I am now. I used to be kind of conflicted about it. Um, but in reality, I'm actually a postmodern. And the postmodern perspective, as articulated by Alistair McIntyre, is that um, there is no actual objective virtue out there. Um, and that the correspondence between you learning to be a civilized person and your society is culturally relative, that what those expectations will be different in different societies, and that there's no objective way to say which ones are better and which ones are worse. Um, this has been, for instance, Sam Harris has hung himself on this hook. Sam Harris trying to argue that there is uh, an objective moral superiority to uh, Western social democratic uh, liberal society. I prefer it as well, Sam, but um, it turns out that ISIS doesn't and Taliban doesn't, the CCP doesn't, and the Russian fascists don't, don't, and a lot of people don't. So how in the end do you, you know, if, if ISIS says that yeah, I don't care that you get to have gay sex in the West. Um, here, we've decided that uh, slavery and subordinating women is the path to virtue. Is there an objective way to say that one is right and one is wrong? I don't really think there is. Um, I'm willing to fight like hell for the values that I believe in, which um, I don't have in the end an ultimate way to defend. But I think in the context of this, what you can say is that uh, if you live in a society, it has some def defined virtues, of, uh, and almost all of them define self-control, for instance, and the ability to care for others and so forth. Whether they understand fairness in the same way that I'm going to talk about in a second, I think is quite uh, variable. And uh, they may have other virtues. So thank God we all live in mostly in societies where it's no longer a virtue to have to fight other men to d the death in a duel to defend your honor or your family's honor. That was cause of a lot of deaths in the past. And at some point in the last hundred years, we uh, more or less gave up on that, although in the Southern United States uh, or on the stages of the Oscar ceremonies, uh, you may see contrary evidence sometimes. Okay. Um, and finally, before jumping into the virtues, I just wanna say I, I'm not for a tech fix mentality. Um, uh, the extended mind uh, here is important to keep in mind because we are situated in our societies. It's extremely difficult to practice individual virtue in a society with overwhelming pressure not to. And so the degree to which we can be constantly reminded about what our society's virtues are uh, 
um, is important um, and living in a society that isn't blatantly contradictory between their concept, you know, the Victorian hypocrisy being an example of this, you know, it's like they, the, the prostitutes were on the street, but the Victorian morality said that prostitution was terrible. What's going on in this society? So having consistent um, uh, upholding of the moral virtues in society is important. And uh, conversely, you can apply in, as individuals, you can have the uh, virtues applied to extremely immoral ends. And so the samurai um, used Buddhist ideas about mental control and mental preparation to uh, be the perfect foot soldiers of a totalitarian regime and to murder people with impunity um, and thinking that that this moment is my last moment and all those kinds of things. Or uh, corporations setting up me meditation centers inside the corporation so that whenever you're stressed out by your 18 hour day or your boss is being a jerk, instead of going to your union steward, you go into the meditation hall and um, cleanse your mind of these imp imperfections. So, uh, and I'll get back to that in a second too. Okay, let's talk about self-control. A lot of our understanding of morality, I think, can be um, reframed in terms of the idea of the human part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, having more control over our moment-to-moment -moment behavior and cognition um, over the limbic system and the more primitive parts of the brain, the animal parts of the brain. And that's useful as a kind of starting point, I think, although the specific components of what uh, goes on in the prefrontal cortex, which have many different kinds of lateralization, um, is also important. And a lot of the literature so far, partly because of accessibility, but um, also because of its functional uh, utility of the DLPFC, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, a specific part of the prefrontal cortex, more or less here. Um, and so stimulating the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with electricity, magnetism, um, sound waves, or suppressing it with those things, um, turns out to have a systematic effect, for instance, on self-control. Now, as I said, the personality trait related to self-control is conscientiousness. We know that self-control is related to dopaminergic uh, variations, genetic variations in dopamine accessibility. Um, it's uh, implicated in attention deficit disorder. It's why we give stimulant medication that increases dop dopamine uh, accessibility in the brain. Um, and so there are a variety of ways to influence self-control behaviorally, chemically, so forth, um, and ways to impair it. I mean, being to not getting enough sleep, uh, having a bad diet, not exercising, all are bad for your self-control. Um, but if we stimulate the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we, for instance, can improve control over addictions. Um, so it's being used as a potential adjuvant therapy for uh, helping people overcome opiate addiction, cocaine addiction, uh, nicotine addiction, things like that. Um, but as I said, and I'll just say this once, uh, there's a hardly any virtue that can be, that cannot be improved or strengthened or enhanced by getting enough exercise, enough sleep, uh, having good diet and probably doing some meditation. Um, and there are many other non-invasive, uh, or less, uh, intense therapies, um, stimulant medications, very commonly used in this regard. And then for the su specific suppression of vices, um, I think the example of testosterone suppression is a very important one, which is um, again, at this, this intersection of psychiatry, criminal justice, at, for uh, people who are sex offenders um, in states or countries where they're offered the option of having uh, chem what's called chemical castration for testosterone. And there, there's some debate about how effective this is for reducing re-offense, um, but it appears to be effective for reducing re-offense for people who have a um, uh, history of sex abuse. And I think it's an example where we're already applying moral enhancement at that line between uh, psychiatry and criminal justice, and where we need to interrogate, you know, here in the United States, 
the American Civil Liberties Union is opposed to offering prisoners this option. And I think they should be offered this option. But in a clinical context, you've got alcohol aversion drugs, uh, buprenorphine for opiates, uh, potential vaccines and gene therapies to help uh, prevent or cure addictions. I'm a little iffy on this one because I think the consequences of uh, permanently changing your brain so that you can't experience the pleasures that um, otherwise would come from a drug addiction would have a lot of side effects. But um, I follow the research with some interest. Um, and neurogenesis itself, the ability to get the brain to generate new neurons, all seem to improve uh, self-control in various ways. Okay. Intelligence. Um, again, intelligence relates to a broad category of intellectual virtues. I mean, Aristotle had half a dozen, dozen of them. Um, prudence, you know, the ability to make good decisions, um, love of learning, being open to new ideas, um, uh, being, uh, uh, being tolerant of ambiguity is part of the intellectual virtues. And these are all roughly correlated with each other. And of course, in the field of uh, psychology, there is a longstanding debate about whether such a thing as intelligence. I do believe there's such a th thing as intelligence. How many kinds of intelligence there are, I think that's more or less a statistical question. There's G, the central component of intelligence, and then these various subcomponents. But that's a longer debate. But just assuming that there is such a thing as intelligence, that it has biological components, it is partly inheritable. Um, and it is enhance, potentially enhanceable. Um, again, the personality trait that is strong, most strongly correlated with intelligence, openness to experience. Um, th we know that there are a, a many, unfortunately, many genes correlated with, uh, through GWAS, general uh, genome-wide association studies, we know that many different genes are associated with um, the various components of intelligence, verbal intelligence, fluid, so forth. Um, and we know that there are many pathologies that cause impairments of intelligence. Again, many ways, possible ways to um, stimulate intelligence or support it. Uh, but in terms of the brain machine interfaces, you've got research on TMS and TDCS and, uh, and, and even the uh, hippocampal implants to improve memory um, that are suggestive. I wouldn't say it's very strong evidence yet that you can strap electrodes onto your brain. There's uh, meta-analyses that show positive benefit and meta-analyses that don't. Um, perhaps Anders would be able to illuminate about the latest state of the research in a second. Um, but I think it's promising. And I think eventually we're going to figure out how to uh, enhance all of these different components of intellectual capacity um, with devices and drugs. Now, in terms of caring, what it means to care, um, I just showed through up two studies here that both had uh, aggression and antisocial behavior as their um, dependent variable. And uh, in both, they were applying TDCS to parts of the brain uh, in this upper study. It was to the VMPFC, the ventromedial part of the prefrontal cortex and to the DLPFC. And there, what they purported to find in this study was that the enhancement of the ventromedial part of the PFC increased empathy, perspective taking, moral judgment, and that that had an effect on antisocial behavior and, and aggression. And that increase in the DLPFC, as I showed previously, um, had uh, an, an enhancing effect on cognitive control and response inhibition. And that that also had a negative effect on antisocial behavior and aggression. So, Again, here we have different kinds of stimulation on different parts of the brain having different but complementary effects on the intended outcome of reducing aggress aggression. And here this study found a direct control, uh, the second study found a direct control uh, effect of TDCS on reducing aggressive intent, but this, then also an indirect effect through its enhancing effect on the assessment of moral wrongfulness of aggressive behavior and that also having a negative effect on aggressive behavior. So at any rate, caring, um, compassion, generosity, empathy. There's two basic kinds of empathy we have to keep in mind here. One is the uh, visceral experience of empathy. And um, during Pramod's talk, I, I mentioned in the chat that um, if you ever read Childhood's End, the 
when the aliens get here, they make uh, a million people experience what it's like to be a bull in the bull ring getting gored and that, you know, this causes a wave of vegetarianism. In Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, PJ, PJ Dick, uh, P, PK Dick, um, he uh, has the idea that of a whole religion built around the idea of people experiencing visceral empathy by holding onto these levers, as I remember it. Um, but at any rate, the idea that visceral empathy is important, I think, is clear. But visceral empathy, there's a, a book by Paul Bloom out called Against Empathy, where he talks about all the ways that visceral empathy leads us astray. The component, the, the complementary to visceral empathy is cognitive empathy, which is the ability to understand other people's uh, situations, to have a theory of mind about other people, um, so that even if they are not obviously stepping on a nail, you can understand from your general understanding of the world and how people's minds work and how your own mind works, that this person is probably in pain or, or ha having a good time. Um, so those two kinds, uh, the cognitive part requires more cognitive components, obviously, and the visceral part is probably more hardwired into uh, mirror neurons and other parts of the brain. Um, but at any rate, enhancing the two of them uh, together or separately is the goal here. Uh, we know, for instance, that serotonin increases emotional empathy. Uh, oxytocin increases um, a tendency towards cooperation and trust so that there's neurochemical components. Um, the pathology of autism is an impairment primary in terms of its effect on moral neuroscience. The impairment of autism impairs the theory of mind and the ability to have cognitive empathy, but not visceral empathy. And psychopathy appears to be more of an impairment of visceral empathy. They understand uh, at an intellectual level what would cause you pain. They just don't give a crap because they don't feel it. Um, and uh, at any rate, the as I've shown over here with these other studies, there's research on the enhancement of caring with brain stimulation. Now, fairness is a related category here. Um, and fairness has a lot to do with the balance between the amygdala and the insula and the prefrontal cortex. That the, the uh, if you, ex if you're walking around twitchy, this I think I, I've, I'm always talking about the twitchy amygdala, but a lot of the research, for instance, on moral neuroscience, you, you can put people into um, a lab and you show them various flashing images and then you measure how much they twitch. And that's coming from this kind of fast thinking, uh, deep brain limbic system response to stimuli. And it turns out that the twitchier your amygdala, the more conservative your political opinions, and the less twitchy your amygdala, the less conservative your political opinions. And this correlates with a wide body of research. You can tell liberals from how messy their apartments are. Liberals have messy apartments, conservatives have less messy apartments, and less tolerance of ambiguity. You can tell from their politics pretty much as well. Um, tolerance for ambiguity about sex and gender, for instance, is pretty qu closely related to this. Um, so this prejudice that wells up out of the animal parts of our brain um, then has to come into our behavior and our cognition. And the degree to which we have metacognition that says, oh, I just saw a woman with a hijab on um, and it stirred up all these complex feelings I have about Islam. Uh, should I scowl and throw a stone or should I just ignore this? Your metacognition is what allows you to catch it in the first place. And then the prefrontal cortex, depending on what values you've got coded into it, the prefrontal cortex may then say, uh, actually, we're not going to do anything about that because uh, we don't really believe up here that um, being, wearing a hijab has any moral significance at all. So we're going to tell our amygdala to shut the fuck up. Um, excuse me. But uh, there is this correlation between the liberal and conservative uh, uh, parts of the brain. The, when we're sleepy or uh, drunk, our uh, prefrontal cortex is weakened in relation to the amygdala and we express more conservative opinions. Um, when we uh, smell something bad or feel something sticky on our fingers, it excites the amygdala and uh, the amygdala has more influence on our behavior and more conservative opinions. When we put people in the brain scanner and ask them the trolley problem about whether pulling the lever is more moral than pushing the fat man on the tracks, pulling the lever lights up the prefrontal cortex, uh, pushing the fat man on the tracks lights up the amygdala causes this to 
difference in the way that we judge those two situations. So um, again, stimulating the DLPFC or the PFC in general, uh, suppressing the activity of the insula and the amygdala, calming it with a drug like propranolol, which uh, has a parasympathetic nervous system reaction, um, reduces our racism, for instance, that's propranolol has been shown to reduce racist uh, attitudes. Um, so there is a lot uh, of complicated relationships between these two. You can enhance one and suppress the other in order to achieve this effect. Happiness, um, again, as I've said already, there's a difference between a hedonic or mood-based approach to happiness and a eudaimonic or uh, flourishing approach to happiness. And we don't want to just, you know, confuse the two. Um, but in terms of mood and positivity, gratitude, optimism, humor, hope, zest for life, all these kinds of related virtues um, that may or may not be recognized in various religious traditions. Some religious traditions only see you know, happiness as a, uh, as a spiritual virtue to be achieved. Like Buddhism would not say that happiness is one of the virtues that you cultivate in order to get to things. It's one of the uh, uh, blisses that you achieve through getting through the virtues. Anyway, um, the depression we know is a, a consistent uh, pathology here. And uh, we, as I've said, it's related with uh, personality trait of neuroticism. And so we're beginning to flesh out some of the reasons why some people have a lower happiness set point, some people have a higher happiness set point. It seems to be about half of, our, um, uh, of the happiness set point that we have, the place that we tend to come back to uh, regardless of environmental circumstances, about half of that is uh, genetic, heritable, uh, determined at birth. It's also related to our uh, experience of the default mode, met mode, net mode network. When our brain isn't activated by something else, what do we fall back into? Thinking about the past and the future and ourself. Um, and that is that kind of rumination is the path to unhappiness. So here um, we have many applications of direct brain stimulation. Uh, all the different modalities that I talked about have been applied, uh, experimented with, with um, treatment resistant depression, for instance, and uh, with more or less success. Um, DBS being one that... Um, okay, apparently this started hours ago. Say again? Oh, okay. I've only been on for less than an hour, but... Um, okay, so the, uh, the intervention into the brain um, with brain stimulation would have an effect on mood. And the final virtue that I want to talk about is transcendence. Transcendence for me is the capacity to... Uh, step outside, again, of this default mode network of um, to see yourself and your world as uh, not having the solidity that you thought it had. It gets back to the, what Pramod and I were talking about in terms of um, the nature of the self. If you think that the self is a, is a self-evident reality and that all of your problems are uh, uh, obvious, set in concrete, all of the conflicts between your desires and the world are things that are immutable, um, then you're going to have a harder time than if you can step out of that and say, well, wait a minute, uh, do I want to have this as a part of myself? Do I want to, do I really want this, this thing that I thought I wanted? Do I, am I really trapped in this dystopia that I thought I was in? Um, or could I perhaps make new choices and see the world in a new way? That, that kind of transcendence, that mutability of your reality um, is that at that line of open-mindedness where open-mindedness is correlated both with being a spiritual person as opposed to a religious or fundamentalist person. It's also correlated with um, believing in ghosts and UFOs and all kinds of things. So it's not just correlated with intelligence or prudential wisdom. It's also correlated with being open to the, the noumenal uh, sometimes doesn't even exist. But um, at any rate, a lot of research on psychedelics has shown that psychedelics can have a permanent transformative effect through uh, giving us this experience of transcendence. This picture at the top is a famous one of um, the connectivity between, between different parts of the brain before and after taking a psychedelic. And um, the second part um, is basically the complete disruption of the default mode network by allowing you know, the, all the parts of your brain to talk to all the other parts of your brain and, and stirring up those uh, ordinary ruminative uh, pathways.
Um, so um, in terms of the effects of, and, and when I started the Cyborg Buddha project back 15 years ago, this was what I thought I would be focusing on. Um, but the research has been pretty slow in this regard. Uh, we had um, this God helmet that I show here. This uh, early research had shown that some people with certain kinds of brain simulation were experiencing the presence of uh, divine beings in the room with them. And they thought that um, they could commercialize this and make a helmet that would give you uh, spiritual experiences. Didn't turn out to be replicable. But um, that said, we know from many lines of research that there is localization in the brain of proprioception, for instance. Um, the ability uh, of your brain to take all of your sensory information and put it together into a model and say, this is what's inside and this is what's outside. <coughs> we know that disorders of proprioception is what leads to conditions like um, false limb syndrome of where people no longer feel like their arm is their arm or their leg is their leg. Um, and maybe related to things like uh, gender dysmorphia, uh, gender dysphoria rather, body dysmorphia. Um, and so uh, we know that that part of the brain can also be modified by certain kinds of experiences. And that when it's uh, modified by, for instance, meditation or certain kinds of drugs, you can suppress its effect so that you suddenly have this experience of oneness with everything, right? make me one with everything. Um, and similarly, the control of time is mutable in the brain. So um, I do think we're on the cusp of coming up with replicable and reliable ways that don't involve the otherwise terrifying experience of taking psychedelics um, uh, to replicate some of these spiritual experiences through electronic means. But we're not quite there yet. Okay. Those are the six virtues. And so in closing, I just want to talk a little bit about cognitive liberty. Um, one of the reasons why I fell out of love with this project for a while was when Trump got elected, uh, unfortunately, the Brits went to Brexit, Brexit, although that seems hardly significant at all anymore. But um, uh, Modi, Duterte, Putin, Xi, uh, Bolsonaro, the list of uh, setbacks for liberal democracy around the world and the rise of neo-authoritarianism or fascism or illiberal democracy. The prospect of writing a book saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if we all had uh, technologies for permanently changing people's personalities seemed a little bit less rosy. Um, and so I've been writing more about what the limits are of neurodiversity, about the relationship between um, the individual uh, uh, rights and social constraints on moral cognition. Um, there's related questions like ASPE rights, like the neurodiversity question, what are the uh, limits of um, clinical limits or even legal limits of neurodiversity within any society. Um, if any of you have read the book or seen the movie Clockwork Orange, um, it's used as just as brilliant Frankenstein is used as a shorthand for transhumanist prospects. Clockwork Orange is used as a shorthand for how terrible neuro modification of moral capacity would be. And I consider it a terrible example because if you've read the book and seen the movie, um, this guy is a terrible guy. And I think we would all agree that um, if all it took for it was for him to be strapped to a chair for a while, for him to never want to commit violent acts again, and then be released from prison, saving us all hundreds of thousands of dollars and giving him back his liberty um, with only the cost that he can't commit violence anymore, that's probably a good trade-off. Um, however, we also live in uh, a century, or we're now just past that century, in which the Soviet Union weaponized um, psychiatry, declared people who had uh, uh, deviant political opinions to be psychiatrically impaired and uh, applied drugs and uh, electric shock treatments and whatever, to try to rehabilitate them. We live in a, a situation right now where the uh, CCP has invented the most advanced form of gamified, electronic, artificially intelligent, totalitarianism ever experimented with, the uh, social credit system, um, which not only punishes you for being a bad uh, loan risk, uh, 
but also punishes you if your friend said something mean about Winnie the Pooh yesterday, uh, because it knows who your friends are and it knows what they shouldn't be, shouldn't be saying and so forth. So um, I'm extremely aware of the potential for this to go off the rails, um, but I don't think it's avoidable. I don't think we can avoid this question because the only way that totalitarian regimes can be stopped from using technology is not by attempting to ban these technologies in the liberal democratic countries, but by stopping totalitarianism. Uh, totalitarian regimes will use technology however they wanna use them. Um, and so what we have to do is stop totalitarianism not stop these technologies. In the liberal democratic societies, we need to be figuring out what a liberal democratic way of regulating and applying these technologies are. What, what are the boundaries of individual freedom around the use of these technologies? Um, so I also think it's important to keep in mind that the technology isn't the only risk to our cognitive liberty. Um, I mean, people have been railroaded into uh, illiber illiberty uh, into control for millions of years, who knows, um, for a long time by cultural norms, political power, uh, and so forth. And we have a lot of challenges to our cognitive liberty um, that are, don't just come from the technology, but I'll, I'll leave that for, for the discussion. And uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, on Apple TV, which not everyone's going to have access to, but uh, there is a new drama out which is, reads to me like a parody of everything I just said and a dystopian, uh, a dystopian reflection of this argument. Um, it's about a company called Lumen that puts chips in the brains of workers to sever their work life from their outside life so that the, wor the innie, the work life person, uh, doesn't remember anything about the outside person and, and vice versa. And then the corporation itself is devoted to the elimination from the world of woe, frolic, dread, and malice um, by the manipulation of various numbers and mysterious ways. And um, they also are trying to literally whip uh, people into shape with virtues of vision, verb, benevolence, and nimbleness. Um, it's uh, an extremely disturbing read for someone like me who's been thinking and writing about this for a long time, and I think um, a useful meditation on how things could go wrong. Uh, let's see, okay, so I have one more thing to say, which was, um, in the end, I think the, the question here is whether we can figure out how to make sure that moral enhancement um, allows us to become more self-determined, more in control, even as we deconstruct and understand from neurotechnology that the self is a fiction. It's still a useful fiction. Self-control is still a useful fiction. Autonomy is still a useful fiction. When I was a child and diagnosed with ADD and I would um, get in trouble, my mother would ask, did you take your pill? My first moral choice of the day was whether I would take the pill that allowed me to be a more moral person for the rest of the day. And I think a lot of children with ADD experience this, that um, the drug enables their moral capacity. Um, so in that regard, I think that these moral enhancement technologies will in fact, can in fact, uh, be uh, ways for us to extend um, this useful fiction of self-determination, even as we understand it in this social context. So at any rate, that's my last thought and hope you enjoyed it. Most of the regulation of NeuroStim and the feedback and related devices that you're referring to is in the public health realm, medical device regulation, the FDA, for instance, in the US. Um, as far as I know, there's relatively little literature in public health and, and global mental health, global health research and global mental health research on the kind of tech of morality that you're referring to. Um, but I'm curious, have you looked at the public health literature and the global psychiatric literature in public health about this? And do you have any reference or perspective on that? Because that does seem to be the current principal realm of governance for these devices. Yes, and it's been a central interest of mine because for me, the techno-progressive perspective that we've been trying to articulate, one of its central features is the uh, 
assertion and defense of the legitimacy of democratic regulation of emerging technologies, as opposed to the techno libertarians who would say that the world would be a better place if the government didn't have anything to say about what you did to your brain or anything else. Um, I think for techno progressives, there's a recognition that um, we experimented with that in the 19th century, didn't work very well. And that's why we created regulatory agencies and that in general, they're doing their job even though they can be improved and uh, sped up and new technologies can, can make them more efficient. Um, so at any rate, yes, I have definitely looked at um, the, um, uh, there's a, a subdivision of the FDA, for instance, that uh, ha is supposed to regulate devices. And so, you know, the, for instance, this um, health tracking device is not clearly within the FDA's domain, even though it has a health application and has these electronic aspects, but anything that goes inside the body, of course, does. Um, the external direct current stimulant uh, stimulation um, is something that you can build yourself and do to yourself. And I don't know that the FDA should have anything to say about that. So there are a lot of complicated questions here about the do it yourself aspect of this, but in terms of whether any doctor who cuts anybody's brain open should be subject to full government regulation and that whatever they put in your brain should have gone through extreme testing so that you understand the costs and the benefits and the informed consent. I absolutely on that. Um, and that's already the case. I mean, there's, there's no doctors opening people's brains up without <laughs> being under that kind of scrutiny in the United States or in the developed world. Now, when you talk about medical tourism, the possibility that there might be, you know, a, a clinic and St. Kitt that would be doing this without um, government regulation or, or not the kind of government regulation that we would expect is certainly a possibility. And I think that's an ongoing issue of medical tourism, and what we do about medical tourism. But uh, was that the nature of your question? And yes, the Europeans are, are, have regulatory methods for this as well. I think it should go through them. Is that answer your question? I, I think so. And, and if I could ask a, a follow on combo question. Um, so I, I suppose I'm looking for um, perhaps um, a model um, or a place to start with working with global public health officials um, and researchers on these issues in ways which enforce, let's say, a techno-progressive, enforce is an interesting word, let's say enforce a techno-progressive view via democratic means, but taking into account how, you know, the professional standards for this, of course, are both national and global and often it's the interchange between professional societies and researchers that forms the basis for developing global standards. Um, so are you familiar with any initiatives that are attempting that regarding some of these devices or more broadly, the speculative technological implications you're referring to? Um, I do have one there, other question after that, but that's, does that clarify a little more what I'm looking for? Well, there are some self-regulatory -reg efforts in, from various companies, um, mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink has been relatively open about some of the ethical investigations they've done. But there's also a consortium of neurotech startup firms that's called Cereb, C-E-R-E-B, <coughs> which came together to support a group of ethical standards for what you should and shouldn't do with neurotechnology. Um, so there's some self-regulatory efforts. Then there's the FDA guidance about um, brain stimulation that has begin, been developing over the last decade. And yes, I'm, I'm aware and supportive of all of those efforts. I, I tend not to be too excited about self-regulatory efforts because mm -hmm. I don't think that they will in the end uh, be as robust um, or uh, useful as government regulatory efforts. Um, but at the other hand, it's also possible to imagine a situation in which, you know, Trump and his lackeys take over the United States and they ban all kinds of things that I don't agree with. And I support individual rights to, to do things. You know, if, if, the, if marijuana were to be recriminalized in the United States, you can be sure that lots of people are going to ignore that. So um, I think the moral situation of when you need to 
follow regulatory guidance and when you don't is a very difficult question. Thank you. And I'm, I don't want to hold the floor if there are other questions, but uh, another one occurs to me. I had one in, uh, I'm not sure if Anders can join in audio, but he, Anders Sandberg asks, could there be virtues that we do not know about or have not yet discovered that we need to consider? Yeah, because uh, it, I really liked this talk and I really liked the maps and especially how the maps of the virtues seem to be the mapping onto the brain. And to some extent, these big domains correspond to big domains of our thinking and feeling. So it's very unsurprising in some sense that we have mapped them out. Yet it seems to be that in ethics, there are ideas that we might actually be able to discover new virtues. For example, environmental ethics uh, has been bringing up the idea that we might actually have to learn certain environmental virtues, which were not natural uh, to our brains, but become natural if we understand ecology and are living in a technological civilization. So I'm curious about the problem of moral enhancement, if we might be lacking in some virtues that we should have, but don't yet have. Well, um, I, you know of John Danaher's recent paper on axiological futurism. And I think this is a central question for those of us in the techno-progressive or transhumanist world about, we know that we're situated in the moral universe of the late 20th century, early 21st century. And we know that uh, if we had been born 100 years before, we might be huge enthusiasts for eugenics, for instance. You know, a lot of our forebears who seem to share some of our passions got felled into that rabbit hole. Some didn't. Um, and I know that my descendants will probably think it's really gross and stupid of me to eat meat, um, or at least eat meat from animals that had to be killed. Um, and so we understand that we're in this historical situation, but it's very, very hard. Just like science fiction authors, when they try to write about what they think the future is going to be like, it's extremely difficult for them to break out of writing about the present and just extrapolating it into the future. Um, once you actually do do that, you know, like some of Greg Egan's work that really does get into that extrapolative futurism, it becomes almost impossible to read because how, how does a monkey brain understand what the future is going to be like? At any rate, I think you're right, um, and that's why I got into Alistair McIntyre's, um, or mentioned it, is that I think from a postmodern perspective, there's no absolute set of moral virtues or absolute map of moral virtues that we can refer to. That's, it's simply what works to describe the reality that we happen to find ourselves in and more or less maps onto the history, recent history that we know about. Um, but when you get to a type two civilization that controls all the energy output of the sun and has a giant matryoshka brain in Jupiter, what will the virtues be? Maybe it's just aesthetics at that point. It's like, we want to build a, a beautiful universe and that's the highest virtue of all things. And only the aesthetic virtues will matter at that point. So I think we have to be uh, quite humble um, about how limited our understanding of what future virtue will be like. At the same time, you, you can't abdicate our responsibility to say, we, we think certain futures will be better than others. And this is, gets back to Nick's paper on existential risks. Some of the existential risks that he talks or talk about, and I guess you've been writing about now recently as well, Anders, um, is the existential risk of us just willy-nilly walking into a future that from our perspective now, we would consider horrific and dystopian. Okay, maybe the people in a hundred years won't see it that way. But if we think it is that way now, What's our moral obligation to our descendants to make sure they don't end up in that future, right? It may be that living in the Terminator future, there's still ordinary pleasures and ordinary virtues to experience, you know, and, uh, but we don't want them to end up in that ter Terminator future. So um, I do think we still have an obligation, even though we recognize that humility. Thank you. Brilliant answer. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, David Wood. I think you had your hand up first. So really uh, fascinating, uh, valuable talk, James, with lots of examples and the framework is uh, very useful as well. I wonder if you think that in a few years time, the discussion will have changed. Uh, 
Today, when we have this discussion, most of the general public is pretty skeptical about this. Most people think, well, there isn't anything that actually helps to make people more caring. There isn't anything around that usefully makes people more positive. There isn't anything around that usefully boosts intelligence or boosts self-control. So do you think that any of the things you were pointing to, whether it's the pharma, the neuropharmaceuticals, the BCIs, any of the others, do you think that any of them might by in a few years' time have demonstrated enough value that the public debate may have switched and that more people will be saying, yes, of course, we should be putting this in the water or whatever so that people are more caring, are more positive, are greater self-control? Or will we still be having the same uh, discussions about uh, theories in, uh, say, five years' time? Well... Part of the situation is that the evidence is already there and it hasn't reached a sufficient weight of a tipping point for people to take it seriously. I mean, I think this is, for instance, in the climate change domain, you had climate change denialism for a long time. And then the far right seems to finally be waking up to the fact that climate change is going to happen. And so now we have ecofascism. You know, it's like, okay, climate change is going to happen. And that's why we have to keep everybody out of the industrialized north, all those refugees. So I think we'll reach a tipping point and where all sides accept that these technologies have the kind of significance that I'm pointing to here. And then all bets are off in terms of how it inter interacts with religious movements, political movements, and, and so forth. So that's one thing to keep your eye on, what, when the, what the tipping points might be. Um, but yeah, I... I, uh, you know, I think there's also a matter of the moving goalpost, which is something that we know from artificial intelligence that, you know, as well, once we get to this point, then everyone will recognize that's artificial intelligence. So we get to that point and people say, okay, you, you can play chess better than everybody else. What else you got? And um, that's probably the same situation we're in now. It's like there's, there is demonstrable evidence that technologies can have an impact on moral cognition and behavior, but um, it doesn't seem to be powerful enough to cause people to accept the proposition. Thanks. Morrison. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for a great presentation. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you've mentioned uh, conversion therapies. In, in the UK, there is a bill about that as well uh, happening right now. And I'm wondering if you could comment on this a bit more. You, you, you've linked that to the um, Russian military aggression. Is it really that um, they might be ang angry about uh, that kind of therapies? Uh, because, you know, I think this is more like about, about the thinking. Uh, you, you've uh, kind of touched about this already. And, um, you, you know, for example, do you think that in the future, because of that kind of fears, we might have problems with a significant uh, other, other significant, you know, um, for example, therapies like gene therapies, uh, which would help us, I don't know, grow our body bigger or um, uh, or stronger. And also uh, another question: When uh, is going? When we are going to have uh, uh, ability to read your uh, new book? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to take a pass on the last one, but I it, I think this uh, piece about um, BCIs was an important step for me. So I, I may be willing to commit to the final project. Um, I, I've got about half of it written already. So we'll see. Um, but in terms of conversion therapy, if you're meaning by it um, converting gay people into straight people or gender conversion, gender transition, um, I think, that, as I said, I think that these that people who are sex gender radicals have been on the forefront, have been the shock troops for our notion of uh, what the expansion of human possibility can be. And because of the fundamental nature of the sex uh, of patriarchy, of heteronormativity, of this gender binary, in the way that we think about culture and religion and everything, those folks have become the litmus test for whether you're willing to accept a truly human free future or whether you want to go back. And um, so what my reference to the Russian aggression is that the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, said a couple of weeks ago that um, he, for, as far as he was concerned, the reason for the Russian invasion was to prevent gay pride parades in, in the Ukraine. And um, 
And you see this concern about gender and sexuality in Viktor Orban and the Poles, uh, the Polish fascist movement, all throughout global fascism. Modi's Hindutva movement, Bolsonaro, who said that he wanted to, uh, that, that a fellow legislator was too ugly to rape. I mean, it's the, the uh, return of the, the worst forms of patriarchal and heteronormative oppression are proposed by the global authoritarian movement. Now, how does it relate to technology? In the research on the uh, neurological or biochemical or genetic uh, components of sexual preference and gender identity, um, there has been both affirmative uh, aspects of that research. In other words, the notion that this is not just a choice this was actually something I was born with, has been embraced by uh, people who are advocating for sex gender freedom. I don't think that sex gender freedom has to depend on a biological basis for sexual preference or gender identity, but um, it can be, but you can use those to at least say it, in the pr present moment, I was born this way and therefore you should accept me. However, if we figure out how it actually works, and we have the technologies to change it, then we've got a complicated situation because we have to say, you should not try to change this. Or uh, people who, you can say to people, once you're an adult, you get to choose what, you, what kind of sexual preference you wanna experiment with. Now, the presum pres presumption of many people in the LGBT movement has been that this would have a negative effect because the uh, overwhelming patriarchal and heteronormative uh, uh, influence of, of various societies would be that it would be used to suppress sex gender deviance. And, you know, we see situations like Iran being one of the headquarters of uh, uh, gender transition surgery in the world because it's illegal to be gay. So once you get caught for being gay, they say, well, you have a choice. We can either execute you or you can become the other gender and you know, other sex, and then uh, it'll be okay. Um, so they're okay with the, the gender part of it, but they're not okay with the sexual freedom part of it. Anyway, um, I think it's a very complicated situation. My presumption is that in a future in which we actually had more control over our sexuality and our gender, um, uh, that we would be, have more experimentation of all kinds. Um, and that, yes, there would be uh, oppressive authoritarian uses of it, but that there would also be sex gender freedom aspects of it. Um, and that's just my hope right now. So I, I definitely am not on the side of those who want to ban the research or the um, experiment with the technologies. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, James, for such a great talk. I'm really looking forward to the panel. Uh, Pramod, James, and PJ mm -hmm. Mania here. Um, so thanks, Heats, everybody for tuning in and we'll see you very shortly. Mm -hmm.